Hey everybody, I'm Fox with Box Hill Games, and let's talk about pretentious game reviews. First off, let's define pretentious, because I don't think that's the most common word in the English language. When I googled it, it came back with the definition of attempting to impress by affecting greater importance, talent, culture, etc. than is actually possessed. When it comes to doing video game reviews, I don't think that anyone's going to deny that video games are not a necessity. Nobody goes out and buys a video game because they absolutely need it. You can argue that you need a car to get to work, to make money, to make a living. You can argue that you need a place to live, so you need an apartment or a house. You can argue that you need clothes to keep yourself warm. All these other things, right? But you can't really argue you need a video game. You don't need a movie. So when we review movies, when we review video games, essentially what we're doing is reviewing entertainment. And this is what you spend your excess money on. This is kind of your throwaway money, money that you have left over after you pay for all the essentials. At least I hope you've paid all the essentials before you buy a video game. And what I'd like to do is avoid drama, and I think the best way to do that is for me to only talk about two different examples of pretentious game reviews, and those will be from two sources that are no longer active. So what I mean to say is they're no longer currently in that particular industry. Uh, the first example is going to be Adam Sessler. Now, he has actually left, essentially, game commentary, game reviews, all that. He came out and said that he was moving on to do something else. I think he's still working in gaming, but he isn't doing game reviews and the same thing he used to do. The second example is going to be the YouTube channel Game Slash Show, which was sponsored by and I think run by PBS. And, I mean, it's PBS, so it might as well stand for Pretentious Broadcasting Station. Let's talk about Adam Sessler. He's one of the biggest names in the gaming industry when it comes to someone who commentates on games, reviews games, and talks about issues in the gaming industry. He used to be on a TV show on, I believe, G4, a network for video games specifically, which is no longer around, unfortunately. At least they don't do video games. Adam Sessler, unfortunately, had a very big change of heart not too long ago, and he sort of moved on, not only from video game commentary, but he got a little nasty towards gamers. He even, at one point, compared people who buy video games to people who buy chemical weapons. And that's not a joke. There's a link to the tweet in the description of the video. I'd like to focus on his The Last of Us review. This is not the first example of where I feel like he went off what I call the pretentious deep end, but it's one of the best examples, and it's one of his more recent examples before he left game commentary and reviews. Essentially, he goes over a review of The Last of Us, and for the most part, instead of really focusing on it as a game review, he's using language, terminology, he's using descriptions of the game that almost make it sound like it's some sort of literary work of art, as if the game is a book that we're reading in a university English class, as if it's a movie like Citizen Kane where we're all supposed to watch it just because it has this significance for what it is in the medium. And while The Last of Us may be a great game, I've never played it, and that's not really relevant here, what you can't help but notice when you watch that review is that he's using a lot of big words, and I can't help but feel like it's pretentious to the extreme. This is a very dark human tale mask. It's very troubled and dark heart. And the fallacy of anthropocentrism that placed mankind's existence at the center of natural order. Like the foliage asserting itself over brick and steel, the mindless drive to exist becomes its own form of zombification, replete with desperation, denial, and terrifying justification. Fighting the feeble authority of the establishment and offering the uncertain hope of a better future in dire times. <laughs> The narrative advantage of games is fully realized in a manner with no equal in the media. Playing the uncomfortably ambivalent character of Joel, whose monomaniacal need to fight onward fixates on Ellie, transforming him to a Don Quixote at the end of the world. I mean, he uses the term anthropocentricism, which I believe is actually a mistake because I think the correct term is anthropocentrism. I think he added a vowel in there and called it anthropocentricism. Now look, like a lot of other people, I went to college too. I've got a degree, I took all those classes, I wrote all those big papers. I knew how to sound like Adam Sessler sounds in this review. That's how I sounded when I wrote my English papers on literature and things of that sort. But this is a video game review and I just can't help but feel like it's not appropriate for the medium. I mean, people want to know, is the video game fun to play? People want to know more about the graphics and the music and the gameplay and the mechanics and the story. All that stuff, the characters, 
And of course, you know, character development and all of that, the narrative, that's fine. We do want to know about that. But when that becomes the central focus to the point where it's almost as if you're overlooking the actual elements of the game that make it a game, I think you've stepped over into the land of pretentious. Back to this word, anthropocentrism. Like I said, he called it anthropocentricism. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I'm pretty sure that's not actually a word, and he meant anthropocentrism. I know what that means. I didn't even have to look it up. It simply means putting humankind, putting humans at the center. Anthro for humans, centrism for centering. So basically, it's the idea that human beings are the central species on the planet, that they're essentially the most important species on the planet. And I'm not going to get into that, because that's really not relevant here. But you'll notice, like I said, this sounds like something you would turn in in a university class. It doesn't sound like something that belongs on a video game review site or a video game review channel. And use of words like that, as well as his comparison to a Don Quixote at the end of the world. Okay, yes, I know about Don Quixote. Shoot, I read it in, in the original Spanish, but you don't see me running around bragging. Well, I guess I bragged right there, but what I'm saying is I'm not really sure that these comparisons, these analogies, these big words are really hitting home any points with the vast majority of your audience. I think the reason that a lot of these pretentious game review sites and channels are starting to go under is because there's not really a base for that. There's no audience for pretentious game reviews. And to use a pejorative, which means basically kind of an insulting word, there's simply no audience for hipster game journalism. There really isn't. It's a very small audience, and the only way a lot of these sites are getting enough views to keep themselves afloat is what we like to call clickbait. I mean, they're posting stuff where the articles are inflammatory, they get people riled up, where the articles are misleading, where they attack people in the articles, where they say extremely extreme things in the headlines to get your attention and make you click. You know, it's that headline where you're like, I don't want to click on it. I know this is going to be garbage. I know it's clickbait, but I just got to click on it to see what it says. I've finally gotten to the point where I can usually resist that. But this is how most of them stay afloat, because if they put headlines that were professional and exactly what they wanted, these kind of literary reviews of games, people wouldn't click, and they would go under as they are right now. A Don Quixote at the end of the world. I mean, come on. <laughs> what is that? I, I, I just, I'm sorry, but I don't see as how that really belongs in a video game review. I'm sure that some people might appreciate that. Some people might look at video games in that way. But I think the vast majority of the audience is going to look at that and think, what are you talking about? What are you going on about? I have no idea what you're talking about. Can you get back to the game? I mean, although it's not used here, there are other people that like to use this new term. It's, it's the latest thing in pretentious game journalism. It's ludonarrative dissonance, which essentially means when the mechanics and gameplay of the game contrast sharply with the story of the game. And a primary target of these people that like to push the term ludonarrative dissonance was Bioshock Infinite. Because they said that the story and setting of Bioshock Infinite had a ludonarrative dissonance when it came to the extreme violence of the game. And all I could do was sit there and read these and watch these videos and think, you know, it seems to me that you don't really like video games. All you like about the, or the main thing you like about video games, I shouldn't say all you like because that's a, a superlative, but I'm being pretentious using the word superlative. Anyway, it seems like the main thing you're interested in is the narrative. And that's about it. I mean, a lot of these people like games where there's very little gameplay. They like games where you don't have to get into combat. They like games where essentially there's almost no gameplay. Games like Her Story, games like Gone Home, which a lot of these critics are just like, oh, these are the best games, it's amazing, it, it, you know, it'll change your world, it's incredible. And all I can do is look at these games and think, these barely qualify as a video game. Some of them, I would not even consider a video game. They are barely more interactive than a DVD menu, and I wouldn't consider a DVD menu a video game. So we have to come back to what is a video game. And for me, a video game has gameplay. That's a discussion for another Fox Thoughts, and we'll get into that later. Of course, there's a bit of subjectivity about what exactly qualifies as gameplay, but I'm pretty sure if you just pick a few things here and there from a menu and watch something unfold, uh, it's, that, that's on the line of whether or not that really qualifies as having gameplay. Now look, I know that making video games more than what they are is something a lot of people like to do. We like to think that our medium is growing up, it's becoming more significant. A lot of people want video games to start doing what 
books do, what novels do, what movies do, and those are different mediums. I once heard somebody say, you never read a book and then suddenly you're stopped and you have to answer a quiz and get a certain number right in order to continue. I mean, there's, there's never a wall preventing you from reading the rest of the book. It's, it's available to you. Uh, you don't watch a movie and it stops for a moment and forces you to pass some sort of quiz or pass a test in order to watch the rest of the movie. And that's true, and that would be ridiculous. But then again, movies and books aren't video games. Video games are structured in such a way where you have to overcome obstacles. You have to overcome challenges. And if you don't, you don't move forward. Video games are not primarily about the narrative. Narratives can be really important. But when you try to turn video games into nothing more than an interactive narrative, I think you're losing focus and you're becoming quite pretentious indeed. I don't have a specific example from the game slash show. I don't know exactly what, how they pronounce that. The game show with PBS, the pretentious broadcasting station. But what you had here was a guy that essentially talked almost exclusively about, quote, social justice, unquote, issues in video games. He talked about feminism and what if Master Chief were gay, and, and all these other things where all I can think of is why, why is your focus every time you re release a video about representation of women in video games, uh, how this represents minorities in video games, violence in video games and how it affects us, and all these other things, I can't help but think that this is not a show for people who like video games. This is a show for people who like to criticize video games for being video games. The main purpose of a video game is to entertain you, and that's fine, because you know what? Not all video games need to be these incredible masterpiece works of art. Not all video games need to have these amazing narratives that blow your mind and draw all these emotions out of you and, and, tell, and give you some sort of greater purpose in life, because just like food, sometimes you just want a quick bite to eat. Sometimes you want to grab a snack, and you know what? It doesn't have to be some professionally made, well-placed gourmet meal with, you know, all the trimmings on the side, six plates in front of you. No, sometimes you're just going to go grab a burger. And you know what? That burger is not some sort of gourmet professional work of a chef, but that's fine. It doesn't have to be. But when you go to McDonald's, when you go to Subway, all right, when you go to any one of these restaurants, and try to look at those and go, oh man, I mean, these are not professionals. I mean, look how this is laid out here, this hamburger, the pickle's not put on there in a professional manner. It doesn't look appealing. I mean, it's fast food. What do you expect? Some video games are just cheap fun. That's it. It's cheap fun for the moment. It's not meant to be anything more significant. And some video games are more than that, and that's fine. But not all video games are. And to treat all video games as if they need to be that professional, a uh, highly narrative, very important, culturally significant works of art. Well, I think that's pretentious. But what do you guys think? Please let me know in the comment section below. I'm Fox with Foxio Games, and I'll see you next time. Playing the uncomfortably ambivalent character of Joel, whose monomaniacal need to fight onward fixates on Ellie, transforming him to a Don Quixote at the end of the world.